Hi guys, um, really nice to see you. I'm Mimi Thibo, if we haven't met before, and I'm going to be talking you through just a few basic ideas on characterization before we have our chat in just a few minutes on Blackboard. I'm recording this in my home, my dog's at my feet. Um, <laughs> there's dog. I hope you've had time to read the um, P.S. Pritchett and the uh, bit of writing from Julia Bell um, that's on Blackboard. Right, so characterization is about making people. Um, and what we're trying to do is make uh, the most believable or the most useful people for our narratives that we can. There are some things that characterization can't do and it's best to kind of get those out of the way straight away. Um, one thing that it can't do, it can't accurately represent the whole of a human consciousness. We are just far too complex for that. So if you're attempting to do that, you're, you're going to fail. So don't even, don't really don't even try. It can't faithfully render someone you know. Um, the whole complexity thing comes in there again and uh, you're always going to be limited by your own relationship with that person anyway. And it can't give us at one glance everything we need to know about somebody in our stories. That last is very important. Um, that uh, the, uh, You can't just throw something out and expect uh, us as readers to understand everything you need us to understand about your character. And if you think about that character of... Um, in the fall, Peacock, that uh, V.S. Pritchett talks about, you'll see a bit more of what I mean. Um, we start off seeing Pritchett getting ready, kind of bolstering up his image by getting dressed. And if we just take that and the name Peacock, we tend to think of him as a very shallow, vain person, which in a way he is. But there's a lot more to him, and that comes across as we go on in the story. So was it, what is it that characterization can do? Um, well, it can provide insights into other modes of being. Um, it creates a bridge of the imagination from our own consciousness as readers to another human consciousness. And I think that's probably even more true of ourselves as writers than it is of readers. Um, and there's some neuro, uh, neuropsychological studies done on this, which I can share with you if you're interested. Um, it also increases our empathy. So especially if we're using close, first per close third person or first person, it can often increase our empathy. Again, the Empathy Lab has done a lot of work on this, especially um, in children's fiction. It adds texture to your setting. Um, characters that are uh, particularly unique to one kind of society or um, country or uh, social class can provide a lot of extra texture to that setting. Um, it can help readers care about your plot through the emotional involvement identification with the main characters. And it also increases the authority of the text so you can make the reader feel as if you know uh, quite a lot about what you're writing about by the depth of your characterization. We're going to look at observation and description first. Um, this is external to the narrative voice. The, narr the character is observed or described by the narrative voice at one remove. So the reader isn't necessarily experiencing inside a, of a body. Um, these observations or descriptions, or they might be um, having experiencing them filtered through the consciousness of, uh, of one of the narrators or the close third person character. So um, uh, one of the characters might think that somebody being um, described um, smells bad, for instance. And we uh, are asked to take that on board, filtered through the what we know about the character. To look at ways of um, using observation description in characterization, there's the Parabo handbag exercise in the, the Joe Bell um, chapter. 
and it's all about physical and sensory descriptions. So there are two main modes of, um, of characterization. There's the observation and description and interiority. You can look back at that uh, the uh, Spritchett story and see, you know, quite a lot of description of the various characters, um, the florid complexions, the you know, somebody being small, all those kinds of things. That's observation and description. And the other mode is interiority, trying to imagine the thoughts of another being. And I know you guys know this because, you know, you're very bright uh, English literature students. But it's a little bit different to observe it in text and then kind of observe it as somebody who's going to be creating these kinds of constructions. There are some um, limitations and common problems with characterization by description and observation. I'm just going to have a little um, chat about those now, seeing, um, seeing if we can get you to avoid them. You know, uh, it's a, a way of speeding up your progress as a writer. So one problem is that the telling observation can be very limited by culture or moment in time. Um, and perhaps uh, there's uh, some elements of that in the, the V.S. Pritchett. But I think you're already really conversant with this because of the things that you have to, that have to be glossed now in some of your uh, reading for literature. So if you think about Jane Austen, who was a keen um, social observer, some of the things that she talks about um, that are very, you know, cutting edge, kind of really kind of sarcastic almost um, observations that occur in her narratives are completely lost on us. And we have to be told what they mean um, because otherwise we just won't understand her characterization. So sometimes you have to be really careful that these things are more about um, the people and not so much about their surroundings, unless you're writing something that's very effervescent that you don't expect to last very long. Uh, I'm thinking about American Psycho in, in terms of Brett Ellis's American Psycho is another one that is really starting to sharply date um, because his observations were so niche to a New York in a certain time. Here's another one that can be problematical, but the narrative, the narrative voice can be very unfair. And um, that's fine because it depends on the point of view and what kind of uh, narrator you've got. Uh, but how will you signal that to the reader that the, that the narrator is being unfair? And how will you kind of differentiate yourself as the author from the narrative voice? Here's another one that's easy to fall into, um, a tendency to use stock characters and stereotypes. Um, Look really carefully when you're writing somebody that isn't going to be in your narrative very long and make sure you haven't just pulled somebody from Central Cat. And here's another uh, little problem that, that it's very tempting to drop in a whole chunk of description instead of working it into the action. That's uh, more of a problem for us now than it was for V.S. Pritchett. Um, you have to be quite careful that you're not slowing down the narrative too much by adding a, a large chunk of description. Now we're gonna talk about interiority. Are you ready to talk about interiority? Yeah, you're ready, aren't you? You're ready. Interiority is thoughts and feelings of one of the characters, usually, but not always the main character. And that's created through an exercise in imagination, a, your lifetime of observations. And if you look at the Paul Maggers and the, and the Joe Bell, You'll see him uh, talk about that really clearly. And this uses sentences that begin like, she felt, he thought, you know, the dog became aware. Now, when we look at these two modes, it doesn't mean that it's either or. You don't kind of choose one and commit to it throughout the story. We, they're just two different ways of using uh, techniques of characterization. They're usually blended throughout a story. And, P.S. Pritchett in the fall does this really, really well. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see that gradually throughout the time of the story, the uh, narrative voice kind of pulls away and adds a bit of distance. So we start off with quite a lot of interiority as Peacock's getting ready. 
And by the end, when he's like falling over, over and over again, we're seeing him almost wholly from the outside. Um, so it moves from that interiority and it pulls back until we're using mainly description. It's a very effective technique. So let's look at some limitations and common problems in using interiority um, for your characterization. So firstly, naturally, it's going to be quite limited depending on the point of view or, or narrative voice or the person. It can be very confusing if you're moving from one point of view to another within the same story. Um, you have to be very careful about doing that, going from inside one person's consciousness to another. It can just kill your narrative drive if you're not careful. It can slow things right down. And new writers tend to make characters way too self-aware, especially in moments of high stress. I recently read a, a new character from an emerging writer who was like running for their lives. And while they were running for their lives, they kind of had a moment where they started to think about running and what it was like for them and how they'd enjoyed it when they were younger, how they'd become unfit a bit as they got older. And, and, you know, you've just got to be really careful that your characters are, are staying in the moment of the action and not to uh, make them have too much time or too much um, self-awareness during the action. Another easy problem with um, interiority is it can be difficult to balance internal and external conflict. And again, you know, it slows down the narrative. So you have to get that balance right. Um, of course, a story can have all internal um, conflict, but that's got to be quite extraordinary, doesn't it, to carry a whole story. Now we're going to talk about characters' rights. So we're going to talk about characters' rights now. And characters' rights is, um, it's a kind of tongue-in-cheek, I'm not sure how tongue-in-cheek it really is, way of thinking about the people that we make. Um, it helps us make uh, better characters as well as make more ethical writing. Uh, it's just a kind of way of thinking about the people that we make as having lives of their own. Do I really think that my characters have lives of their own? Probably not. Um, I know that they're figments of my imagination. However, this way of thinking about your characters makes you that little bit more responsible. And something about it very much helps create more believable characters. So I'm passing it along to you. The central tenets of characters, right? The central tenet is that characters are people too. Um, characters are complex. Um, if you think about the chapter in Bennett and Royal that dealt with characterization, Andrew Bennett talks about how every believable character contains a paradox and humans are just like that, aren't they? Characters deserve to be unique individuals. And I think that's very useful when you think about, you know, you, you've got a, uh, you know, somebody from the police who's outside a, a tape in one of your stories. If you think of that as a, a, a real human being, that person, instead of just a police person, it's going to add a lot of texture to your stories. If you go to the supermarket and your character, you know, having an interaction with whoever's on the checkout line, that person needs to be a real person too. The more you can use your imagination to make these real people, the stronger your fiction's going to be. That doesn't mean you have to write, you know, 20 pages about the, the police person or the checkout girl. It just means that the, if you do the work of the imagination, it's going to improve your story. And this is, I think, the most useful one. Characters exist outside of your intentions for them in the plot. If you can think of your characters as real people and not just, you know, cardboard cutouts that you're moving around in your plot, um, you know, to make the ring get to Mordor or whatever you need to do, then you'll find that your plots are much stronger because they're coming out of, you know, real situations with real people and 
that makes everything in your story feel much more believable and authentic. And then your ideas and, and your um, concepts and what you want to get across in your story are going to get across a lot better. So here's some ideas for getting started making some people. Um, these are some exercises that you can use. You can take two or three people you know well and smush them into one person. You can use a character from a film or a book that you really like and you can place them in a new setting and change their looks and give them a different mode of expression. Sid, where you can watch people walk by and quickly describe them. This is like a, 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 a artist using their sketchbook, only you're doing it with your um, phone or <laughs> pencil and pad um, using prose. Imagine by looking at their exterior selves what might be going on in their interior consciousness. Now, I know that it's harder these days, um, but it's, it's very good to develop a habit of eavesdropping. Listen to how the people talk as well as what they're talking about, and always listen for what they're not saying. When I was first um, writing seriously, I lived in West Yorkshire in the 1980s, and there was a bus um, that was the first off-peak bus. It was like at 10 past nine in the morning. And I used to go to market and all the old ladies used to get on it to go to market. And I used to get on it too, um, mainly just to eavesdrop um, on these amazing ladies. This was the generation that, you know, had won the war. So they were all, you know, my age or older. Um, and it was just amazing, this kind of stories and the way they used English. Um, I just loved it. So I eavesdropped, you know, lots. Um, I remember once this old woman was telling this just amazing story and I uh, didn't want to stop listening. So when she and her daughter got off the bus, I, f I followed them and... Um, and it wasn't until I'd actually gone into their gate with them that I realized I'd gone a bit too far. Now, I'm not suggesting you get that into it, but just listening to the people around you can be very, very useful for you as a writer. And it helps you um, to get out of your own kind of comfort zone in terms of what kind of people you know and what kind of people you understand and start to understand other kinds of people and, you know, get a feeling for what um, those kinds of lives are like. I hope that's been a useful kind of introduction to the craft of um, writing characterization. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you in just a, a little while. See you soon. Bye. Say bye-bye. 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 Oh, dear. Bye-bye.